Good afternoon and welcome to those joining us. We'll be getting started in just a minute. I'm watching the number count go up as you all are entering the virtual auditorium for this special event. It's a big crowd. Again, we'll be getting started in just a minute. Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started? Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Rick Page. I'm Dean of the Larner College of Medicine, and I wanna welcome you to the sixth annual State of Research at the Larner College of Medicine and our celebration of research excellence. We're presenting this via Zoom, and actually we've live streamed uh, each year to all of our partners who aren't able to be here, but this year we're entirely virtual for the second year running. Um, I'm thankful to have this technology and I look forward to meeting in person next year. This event has grown out of a strategic commitment to recognize accomplishments in research at our academic health system. I'm so pleased this celebration has brought together the work of, of graduate students and their mentors on Monday as they presented, and yesterday, an outstander Larner alumni scientist, Junjie Shen, shared his, uh, his wisdom, advice, and research with us. And just this afternoon, we were fortunate to hear our colleague and Larner Research Laureate speaker, Dr. Ann Dixon. Professor Dixon was joining us from England, where she was celebrating her mother's 80th birthday and uh, what a way to celebrate it uh, by giving a talk to us here in Burlington. I'd offer, like to offer a special welcome today to UVM Vice President for Research, Dr. Kirk Dombrowski. Sustaining and expanding our successful research enterprise here at the Larner College of Medicine can only come about through cross-campus collaboration. And we're so fortunate to have a strong connection with and support from Dr. Dombrowski and UVM's Office of the Vice President for Research. Dr. Dombrowski joined UVM in early March, 2020, an interesting time to make this kind of move. And despite the challenges of, of a pandemic that occurred just about the time he arrived, he's proven to be a dynamic and successful leader and an important partner to the Larner College of Medicine. I'm delighted that he's able to join us here today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kirk Dombrowski. Great, well, thank you, Dean Page. Uh, and congratulations to the Larner College of Medicine on a, on a tremendous year of research. Uh, overall, UVM earned $204 million in sponsored awards this year, which is up from 181 million last year. And again, with the College of Medicine, uh, leading the way with more than half of that total. Uh, UVM has seen a 45% increase in federal funding over the last two years, thanks in large part to increases from the LCOM faculty. And in, in 2021, we broke $200 million in external awards for the first time ever in the history of the university. At the Office of Research, we're very excited about the many things happening at the Larner College of Medicine right now, from the addition of the Firestone Building to the work of our new COBRI project uh, leaders who began this year, and to the enormous efforts going into things like the renewal of the Northern uh, New England CTR. Outside of UVM, I have the privilege of sitting on the National IDEA EPSCOR Coalition Board of Directors, uh, working to get more attention and more resources to the IDEA program. And everywhere I go, virtually these days, at NIGMS and to those institutes where our young investigators are being recognized, places like NCI, NHLBI, NIDA, or NIAID, the work of the Larner faculty are well known. And it makes it easy to argue for greater attention to the important work being done outside the larger medical research systems. Without exaggeration, uh, we are regarded as one of the highest performing IDEA programs in the country by the NIGMS leadership. Uh, and that reputation extends out from NIGMS to the rest of NIH, opening opportunities for recognition uh, for our accomplished faculty and opportunities like early career reviewer opportunities at CSR. 
Uh, looking back over this last year, there were 371 awards in the Larner College of Medicine for nearly $100 million, up from 348 awards in 2020. The largest proportional gains were in uh, several departments, endocrinology, uh, general internal medicine, surgery, uh, PEDS, pulmonary, and in hematology oncology. The largest total gains over a million dollar increase over the last year included uh, hematology oncology, biochemistry, microbiology and molecular genetics, uh, OBGYN and neurological sciences. And we had incredible large grants that included work by uh, Judith Shaw, Russ Tracy, Hugh Garaban, uh, Juliana DeMoss, uh, Beth Kirkpatrick, uh, Tom Simpatico, Noah Kolb, uh, Steve Higgins, and Yvonne uh, jensen Henninger. Of course, research is about more than just award levels and more than the lead PIs on the largest grants. It's about the tremendous things we do with those awards and the many, many people who make those projects possible. We're going to hear a lot more about that over the course of the next hour. And I'm really pleased to be here with you to celebrate the tremendous accomplishments of the college and its enormous impact on the health of Vermont and the world. So I wanna thank you, Dean Page, for the opportunity to be here uh, and the opportunity to enjoy this great event. Thanks very much, Vice President Dabrowski. We're now going to hear a, an update on the state of our research mission and then spotlight research ex excellence across the board at the Larner College of Medicine and the UVM Health Network Medical Group. We'll acknowledge both the scientific inquiry taking place throughout our institution and its partners and the important mentorship and training that fosters the research community of the future. A successful, vibrant research community doesn't happen by accident, but through a lot of really hard work. We're here to celebrate that vision and the dedication of the members of our research com community. And I wanna say I'm personally grateful to all of you. And now to share a deeper view of our current state of research and then present the awards, I'd like to welcome Dean Gordon Jensen, who since 2015 has served as our college's senior associate dean for research and really was the person who, who uh, brought together these annual research celebrations in our college. I'd also make note that since 2019, Dean Jensen has served as director of research for the UVM Health Network. After presenting his state of our research, he and Dean Berger will present this year's awards. Please now join me in welcoming Dean Jensen. Well, thank you, Dean Page. Um, am I successfully sharing my screen? Yep. Looks good. Okay, we're gonna zip through uh, an overview of the state of research at the Larner College of Medicine. I'm not gonna be able to go into great detail about individual topics, but please feel free to reach out to me if you're interested in more information about any uh, particular uh, topic. So we've had our opening remarks by Dean Page, uh, and welcoming remarks and, and remarks from, from VP for Research, Kirk Dombrowski. Uh, I'm gonna talk a bit about state of uh, research and then we'll move to the research awards uh, celebration. So this is a quick, uh, agenda for the state of uh, research at the college address. Going to briefly touch on the pandemic, talk a bit about Firestone and the uh, Center for Biomedical Shared Resources, updates on faculty hires and recruitments, publications and grants. We're going to touch on the uh, COBRAs and the uh, Northern New England CTR the uh, Center on Rural Addiction, the Center for Health Services Research, and then focus in on our, our core services and support and wrap up by talking a bit about strategic objectives and uh, opportunities. So, so a lot for about 25 minutes. Um, I felt like I had to throw up the, the latest uh, pandemic uh, figures, uh, but not because I want to depress everyone. It really is to highlight the tremendous accomplishments of our research faculty, staff, and trainees throughout the pandemic. And goodness, hopefully we'll see some improvements here uh, soon. But I think it's remarkable that we have done so incredibly well. We've been almost completely open for the majority of the uh, pandemic uh, successfully. 
engaged in multiple research uh, domains with tremendous funding, tremendous publications and accomplishments throughout. And I throw up just one example, and, and there are many, but I wanted to throw up one of the most striking examples. And that is the big AstraZeneca vaccine tra uh, trial uh, for which Beth Kirkpatrick was the site principal investigator here. And uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick and some 25 of her colleagues, staff and associates here are actually named in this recent New England Journal of Medicine report on the AstraZeneca trial. This was a huge, huge undertaking. And again, we have many other tremendous accomplishments, but I just wanna cite this one as, as a really spectacular example of how the Larner College of Medicine and our faculty, staff, and students have really stepped up. Moving forward, I want to touch a, a bit on the, the Firestone Medical Research Building. Uh, I mean, literally, you know, just a year ago, we were just getting started. If you look at the construction picture here in the upper left uh, corner, then uh, we did our topping off ceremony with the signature beam in April. Of course, we tried to talk Dean Page into climbing onto that beam you see raising up into the sky. Uh, he deferred uh, and no one else volunteered, but it was a fun day's event. And more recently, we had one of the more curious groundbreakings you will ever see. It was indoors uh, just last month, uh, you know, here, uh, uh, in the uh, lobby, uh, and you can see we had multiple ground makers with, with uh, really boxes that looked a lot like cat litter boxes, but it was dirt and it was a very successful event, got a lot of good attention and exposure, uh, was a great deal of fun. Uh, and then uh, here's an October picture. We're a little bit further along uh, than the uh, picture you see there in the lower, lower right. Uh, and indeed, there's actually brick going up on some of the building already. So we are a bit beyond 50% uh, uh, completion. And this is truly a, a remarkable accomplishment uh, during the uh, pandemic. And of course, this is not just about our college. It's about the whole university and our region. It's about jobs. It's about new labs uh, and facilities for our research faculty, staff, and trainees. Now I want to touch uh, a little bit more on the Firestone Medical Research Building and space planning. Uh, but before I do, I want to specifically acknowledge Eric uh, Gagnon, uh, who has just been a remarkable asset throughout this uh, building uh, process. And uh, we're looking for his continued contributions moving forward. Uh, right now, many of you are aware, we're in the thick of the challenges beginning the space assignments in the building and strategic planning around that. Uh, we've committed about 68% of the assignable uh, square feet uh, with another 15,000 square feet not committed to support uh, strategic priorities of LCOM. If you look at it by floor, the first floor of the new building is for the new Center for Biomedical Shared Resources uh, and the uh, Vermont Integrative Genomics uh, uh, Resource uh, and Mass Spectrometry Flow Cytometry and the Vermont Genetics Network. About half of the second floor is assigned to uh, redox biology and the Vermont uh, Lung Center. We're planning a, a contiguous arrangement there uh, that included HSRF2 and the, the Lung Center. And then the third floor, about 40% of the Firestone space is assigned to the Cancer Center uh, at present, and that may grow in addition. Um, we'll be emptying spaces in a given building uh, where, um, uh, I actually skip the, I want to back up to the fourth floor, which was the Center for Cardiovascular and Brain Health. So uh, Mark Nelson uh, and uh, Mary Cushman's uh, team uh, and the space will be vacated includes pharmacology, the lung center, uh, some of the cancer center space on an HSRF, the microscopy core, flow cytometry and the integrated genomics resource, all of whom will be going to the first floor of the Firestone building. Right now, 
were slated to begin occupying the new building late fall into December, uh, meaning that we have a year to plan additional uh, space assignments. It's a huge process. And of course, one of the key tasks before Eric and, and myself and the whole facilities team is just the sheer logistics of a move like this to move laboratories, complex, expensive equipment, lots of people. Uh, so I think uh, uh, Colonel Gagnon's uh, experience in the military is likely to be very helpful as we work our way through this. Uh, briefly touching on the Center for Biomedical Shared Resources, this is the new grant that we brought in a year before. Uh, it's an NIH CO6 Biomedical Facilities Grant uh, for $5.4 million is helping to pay for that. Moving in is the uh, Microscopy Imaging Center, the uh, Integrated Genomics Resource, Flow Cytometry, and Mass Spec. Uh, Doug Todges has stepped up already to serve as the director for the new center. Uh, Nicole DeLance is in a position right now as 50% of a business manager. And recall, we're looking to develop common approaches to scheduling, billing, tracking outcomes. We have a new website already up uh, shown there. And we're looking to uh, open a new facility in the fall of 2022, but we knew uh, that we needed to just begin the logistics planning uh, a year ahead of time. A very exciting development is, is that Frank Carr just got a fantastic priority score of 10 on a R24 uh, effectively attached to the CBSR that will enhance our regional position and will actually help pay for uh, people and other resources if we get that award, which seems likely. So a very exciting uh, development. Uh, I wanted to briefly highlight uh, a, a nanoparticle analyzer, the uh, Zeta View. Uh, which is now available in the flow cytometry and cell sorting uh, facility. Uh, this piece of uh, equipment was brought in by a successful uh, NIH S10 instrumentation grant by Dan Weiss. And this allows you to analyze biological nanoparticles, extracellular vesicles, exosomes, virus, or virus like particles. And again, you can access this uh, uh, piece of equipment in the flow cytometry core and can reach out to Roxana Del Rio uh, Guerrera. And I'm mentioning this because specifically uh, we'd like to see uh, better uh, utilization of this new piece of exciting uh, equipment. I said I'd briefly mention where we are with faculty hires for FY21 here. You can see going back uh, for the fiscal year, there were um, seven new uh, faculty hires as shown. We currently have another seven uh, open uh, recruitments ongoing. Uh, of course, these had been somewhat limited by the pandemic and our resources, but of course, we're hoping to continue to boost our uh, successful recruitments and hires. These are our peer reviewed uh, publications. Uh, we continue to run right around a thousand peer reviewed uh, publications per year uh, from the Larner College of Medicine. Uh, and we've recently, the last uh, two years here, switched to doing this uh, through academic analytics. Uh, and uh, with this digital approach, uh, we're actually, uh, you know, confirmed the kind of figures we've had for a while. I think this is truly remarkable uh, during the pandemic that we've been able to sustain this. And uh, you all deserve congratulations for that. Uh, as as uh, Vice President Dombrowski did, I wanted to highlight some of the major, and these are individual grant awards, not, not pooled. Uh, and again, they'd be, uh, you know, Judy Shaw, Steve Higgins, Russ Tracy, Mary Cushman, uh, uh, Mark Nelson with, with Mary, uh, Steve Higgins, uh, Beth Kirkpatrick, Ralph Budd, Sylvie Dubé, Hugh Garavan, and then Gary Stein, who had two come in at $1.6 million each. And of course, tons of other people uh, have 
contributed to the 99.5 million in total that we brought in an extramural funding for FY21. Uh, and again, congratulations to all of these investigators and their teams, uh, really a remarkable uh, performance. So I wanna switch bases a little bit and talk about the COBRAs uh, and the CTSR. So we have uh, three that are active at the present time, the Vermont Center on Behavioral Health with uh, Steve Higgins, PI, uh, Translational Global Infectious Disease Research with Beth Kirkpatrick as PI, uh, Vermont Center for Cardiovascular and Brain Health, Mary Cushman and also Mark Nelson, and uh, the Northern New England Clinical and Translational Research Network with Gary Stein, SPI. Uh, and I ask each of the centers uh, to outline for me uh, a few accomplishments for the, the past year. Uh, and, and Steve Higgins submitted these for the Center on Behavior and Health. Uh, and this is number one here is truly remarkable, which was a, a successful competitive re renewal for their NIDA supported T32. And this is actually for years 31 through 35. Uh, so we've had this T32 in our hands for more than 30 years. Uh, they also had their national conference uh, on rural addiction and health. A special issue of preventive medicine came out along with that. Among their many peer reviewed articles were, were two that warranted special uh, recognition, uh, both in JAMA Psychiatry by Bolivar and the second one by Heil. Uh, and then Steve also shared that their associate director, Phil Ades, had been uh, honored uh, by the Department of Medicine with their Distinguished Mentor uh, Award. Uh, Tigger, which uh, I love the name on, and Dr. Kirkpatrick knows this because our, our dog is named Tigger. I also think they, they really do have the, the, the best logo of, of all our, our, our Cobras at the moment. But uh, they recruited three junior faculty, uh, Dr. Bruno Martorelli uh, de Genova, uh, uh, Dr. Emily Bruce, and Dr. Jean Gabriel Young. Uh, they received a competitive uh, NIH uh, supplement for uh, on modeling for pandemic preparedness, and they also submitted a large NSF planning grant. They awarded uh, four competitive new pilot awards this year uh, to Drs. Majumdar, Gleason, Nowak, and Thali, and they began a series of monthly academic uh, sessions included on things like infectious disease modeling, vaccinology grant reviews, and a rotating boot camp uh, program. So uh, very active this uh, past year. And then the newest uh, of these, the Vermont Center on Cardiovascular and uh, Brain Health, uh, directed by Mary uh, Cushman and, and Mark Nelson. Uh, they're very active with manuscripts and publications, have a big uh, pipeline of investigators, had an annual symposium in June, they have monthly conferences in Journal Club, uh, they have cores directed by Neil uh, Zakai and Peter Durda, and, and another by uh, Todd Clayson, they launched their, their um, website. Uh, Masai Okoiti uh, landed an Orphan Disease Center grant. Uh, Osama Haraz was named to the Early Career Editorial Board of Physiological Reviews. And Abby Johnson got a ninth percentile score on a first uh, R01 su uh, submission. Uh, they also have one of the most substantive pilot grant programs on campus. And they awarded their first uh, $200,000 award over two years to uh, David Puni Hawley and to uh, Yang Guang Oyu uh, for work determining the structural basis of amyloid fibril cytotoxicity. Uh, and uh, Mary wanted me to highlight that they'll have another uh, IFA for another round coming up in December. So uh, for our first year, uh, truly impressive uh, accomplishments. Uh, with regard to the Northern New England uh, CTR, uh, Dr. Sign sent a, a host of, of uh, notable pilot projects. And of course, the CTR has been funding uh, anywhere from you know, uh, five to 10 or so pilots uh, annually. Uh, and some of the more notable ones looked at social distancing and, and older adults, uh, messaging uh, to encourage 
uh, COVID-19 vaccine uptake in rural Americans, uh, looked at uh, implementation and validation of a field assessment uh, stroke triage for emergency destination, uh, looked at uh, emergency department initiated group renorphine intervention for opiate use disorder. And one I'm especially proud of uh, was an investigation of food security insecurity during the pandemic across uh, Northern New England. So, uh, uh, you know, Vermont, uh, New Hampshire and Maine that was done in collaboration with the Gund Institute and jointly funded by Gund, by the Maine Research Institute and the Dean's Office here at the College of Medicine. This particular pilot has already resulted in a major USDA grant. Uh, in addition, funded grants that came through the CTR this year, uh, some of these are supplements, including one on COVID testing hesitancy, another on vaccination hesitancy, rural addiction treatment access, and HPV vaccination hesitancy. And as VP Dombrowski mentioned uh, just last month, the uh, renewal proposal for the second five years uh, was submitted. So it was a very busy year. Uh, for the CTR. Um, the Steins were also busy. They brought in uh, uh, another project. Uh, it was a big program project funded by NCI, $9 million over five years to identify new targets for breast uh, cancer prevention and treatment, uh, included all the participants uh, listed here and projects focused on compromised epigenetic regulation of genome organization and expression, epigenetic mechanisms controlling genes in breast cancer onset and progression, and non-coding RNAs in breast cancer biology and pathology. And this is a big grant that leveraged the uh, CTR in its development and support. Last of the, the uh, centers I'm going to mention uh, this afternoon is the UVM Center on Rural Addiction, directed by Stacy Sigmund and first, uh, funded by uh, HRSA. Uh, they've, uh, over the past year, had a series of community uh, rounds, webinars with multiple attendees, lots of peer to peer monitoring and consultations to assist rural providers. Uh, they have a best practices scholarship programs that provides rural practices with the opportunity for two days of in-person training and consultation and gave more than 300 uh, presentations to a host of diverse audiences. In the year ahead, they're looking to develop an interdisciplinary clinical rapid response team. They're launching an evidence-based practices office hours platform, and they're gonna continue the best practices scholarship program. I'm also quite optimistic that they're going to receive funds uh, to establish a clinician fellowship program to train practitioners in rural addiction care uh, and of course opiate use disorder. So a lot of exciting developments and funding there. Quickly, the, the Center for Health Services Research directed by Adam Atherley has active projects now working with our health network, with OneCare and with the Vermont state government and public health focusing on evaluation of care and financing innovations and effect on outcomes and quality of care and cost. They have an exciting new collaboration with Southern Maine and a variety of new sources of funding, both internal and external. Uh, in terms of some recent breakthroughs, they have a data use agreement that will allow LCOM faculty to access full state discharge data, including uh, restricted data elements. And VCures, the all payer claims database, has now been linked to both vital statistics and the cancer registry, which is sort of like the holy grail of health services uh, research, if you will. Uh, and they're also using the behavioral risk factor surveillance uh, survey. So continue to uh, do some exciting work there and growing the relationship with the uh, health network and with the state. So, I want to switch gears now and talk a bit about research cores and services. I don't want to go through the whole uh, slides. I can see I lost an eye on investigational pharmacy somewhere. Uh, I just want to briefly touch on the things I've highlighted in red. The first is we are working on development of the BSL-3 facility as a new shared resource. There's still a lot of work 
to do there, but we have made some progress. We recently brought in an external consultant to guide us on how best to do this. We have a working group looking at options to support organoid research here at, at LCOM and UVM. A lot of interest uh, there. We're just getting started. In terms of other resources, we now have additional resources at the college level to assist with grant professional development and grant writing. Uh, this has been a collaboration with Kirk Dombrowski's office as well. Uh, we are in the process of acquiring a clinical trials management system. We're working with the Cancer Center and the Dean's Office and some of our other personnel in that regard. And there are also a number of important new mentorship initiatives. Uh, one uh, that Mary uh, Cushman is uh, leading in the Department of Medicine, but also in the CTR is going to be a major push to develop mentorship training opportunities. So if you will, we're gonna mentor the mentors and get more strong uh, research mentors available to our faculty. Whoops, I think I went one too far. Like that. Um, Wait, two, too far. Go back one, two. Okay, clinical. Make sure I didn't jump more than what I wanted to. I did. I'll stop. Okay, got it. <laughs> I wanted to quickly touch on the uh, the biobank, the Cancer Center biobank. Um, I'm highlighting it because this is another resource we're interested in seeing uh, appreciably greater use of. I want to make sure that everyone is aware of it. It's established in 1988, it stores nearly 5,000 specimens. Uh, some of them have matched tumor and normal patient samples. There are fresh frozen surgical specimens and autopsy specimens. There is a specimen associated clinical data and it's possible to search the database to match your research goals with available specimens. You can reach out to uh, Don Weaver or John DeWitt, uh, Mark Evans or Christine Edmondson. Their website is shown here. This is an important resource that, that we really need to see uh, better utilized. Uh, in terms of clinical research uh, support, uh, these programs are directed by uh, Kim Lubers, our Assistant Dean for Clinical Research. The uh, Office of Clinical Trials Research for FY21 assisted with 165 research agreements, 124 projects, 49 unique PIs, generating a profit of 442,000, half of which was returned to the departments. The quality review process that we were doing for some of the uh, clinical research projects was interrupted by the pandemic, but we look to resume that. The Clinical Research Center offers all the services shown here. In fiscal year 21, uh, conducted 75 projects supporting 48 unique PIs, over 1,800 outpatient visits, over 1,200 the Brickyard Research, and of course, this is the big vaccine trial. And the clinic uh, conducted an additional 573 remote follow-up visits. They're involved in a huge project uh, Follow, uh, working with uh, Vermont um, Public Health. And of course, this is a domain that was heavily impacted by the pandemic. We are largely in, in full operation now. This are uh, uh, figures from, uh, from Kim Lubers uh, showing the activities of our clinical research navigators. The navigators can be accessed by a simple online consultation form. The link is shown here. And what you can see, if you look at that histogram on the left is the number of uh, navigator interactions with faculty, staff, trainees have grown uh, profoundly. The types of services requested are shown in the right histogram, access to REDCap uh, being the leaded ser leading service, followed by a host of initial consultations with the navigators. And these folks can provide assistance with finding a mentor, identifying training, identifying funding opportunities, assisting with the IRB, a host of activities. And uh, we really would like to promote their services. They have been very useful. Uh, last one is new training uh, that Kim Lubers and I have worked to develop on the conduct of clinical research. One is the required clinical research coordinator training program that was launched in August of 2020. You can see the sessions and individuals that have been trained so far. Uh, this has been a real breakthrough. 
Uh, it means you can't just take somebody who has no background at all, put them in clinical research and say, here's your coordinator, you're good to go. Uh, so it's very important that anybody looking at such an opportunity understands that they need to complete this training. This is now being used across all of Northern New England through the CTR uh, program as well. New initiatives were just this past summer, they expanded a, a course offering uh, targeting uh, the medical students doing the summer research fellowship. And in the coming year, you'll see one that'll be available more broadly targeting clinical uh, investigators. Uh, I wanted to briefly remind people of a series of, of services that are available that we've talked about before. Biomedical statistics, Peter Callis is our core director. You can still get up to five hours of assistance per grant application that is available to LCOM faculty members or trainees. We continue to work on integrating uh, biomedical statistics and bioinformatics with the new Center for Biomedical Shared uh, Resources. Uh, I wanted to again mention the research incentive program, but a lot of questions about this. Back in the spring, we announced that we were doing it for FY21. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, we set aside funds annually for this program. It's based on a uh, percentage of the total FNA brought in by each qualified faculty member. It can be used in, as an unrestricted fund or as additional pay. We have a faculty working group that each year rever reviews the outcomes. The payments for FY21 will be forthcoming any time now. They were delayed because all of the uh, faculty effort certification on research grants has to be completed before this can, uh, before the payments can go out. But and, uh, Brian Cote assures me it is just about done. We also offer uh, salary support for faculty that are working on major institutional grant opportunities. Uh, it'll support up to 20 to 40% effort at the NIH cap for three months. Uh, requires a simple, simple little application outlined there that is submitted to me. Uh, ad hoc committee uh, reviews it. And this support mechanism has already been associated with a host of successful COBRE and training grant applications. So if you're working on developing uh, something like that, just reach out to me and I, I can help you uh, with this application. It's a pretty straightforward process. We also put in place, just a reminder again, support for training grants. One, you can get support for helping develop it and submit a training grant. But if you are successfully awarded a T32, you can receive 5% salary support at the NIH cap uh, for the period of grant funding. The uh, application process uh, is listed here. Again, it's a simple little application that comes to me. And uh, we have a host of current training grant PIs who are already being supported by this mechanism. And I would highlight Gary Ward, who received our most recent microbiology and in immunology T32, who received uh, the development support, as well as the uh, ongoing support for a training grant. If you have any questions, you might reach out to him and, and ascertain his experience. Pilot research funds, we've resumed our internal pilot and bridge support programs in full. Uh, I want to acknowledge Matt Wargo, the chair and other members of the research committee. Uh, we will also plan in the context of the CBSR grant to resume our targeted pilot funding in 2022 for new methodologies in basic research in conjunction with one of the research cores. We had done that program successfully the year before. And I definitely want to acknowledge uh, Renee Stapleton and medical student research. She's our director of medical student research. Uh, this past summer, we set a new record in our summer fellowship program between the first and second years with 41 funded medical student participants. Uh, of course, our students are also engaged in research projects in public health, and we're also offering an internally funded research gap year fellowship between years three and four, and we can do one to two of those a year. And right now, we're really focused on trying to increase awareness of these opportunities among our medical students and our faculty. In terms of health network uh, opportunities, 
we have a new uh, network research working group that's meeting regularly with stakeholders and key leaders, providing updates on a host of network research projects and opportunities. We continue to work on the electronic uh, data access issues to overcome uh, impediments. And a key priority here is to enhance clinical trial opportunities and network. Uh, capabilities to support them. And I would say that throughout the pandemic this past year, we actually have been able to roll out a very significant number of clinical research uh, projects uh, that do impact the uh, network. So to wrap up where we are uh, with um, our uh, state of research and our strategic plans, these are the objectives from Vision 2025. Uh, improve infrastructure. We're certainly making progress there with Firestone. We've got a lot of work to do with given building. Uh, in terms of providing sustainable resources, we're working on the uh, uh, CBSR, uh, enhanced data processing and, and uh, storage capabilities is a high priority for Jill Jamison. Uh, we're making some headway. Uh, we continue to focus on our current strengths and identify future opportunities like organoids, for example. Uh, a lot of work going into supporting innovation and entrepreneur, entrepreneurship. Uh, a lot of this coming from Kirk Dombrowski and the uh, VP's office. Uh, I mentioned before, we're really working on, on mentorship development, career development. Uh, we still obviously are hoping to do more in terms of enhancing faculty recruitment and retention and then diversifying our funding portfolio. So that's a, a lightning overview of the state of research uh, uh, at the college. Uh, as we've done before, we'll disseminate my entire presentation as a PDF to everybody. It will also be on the website. Again, feel free to uh, reach out to me with, with uh, questions, concerns. Uh, obviously, I couldn't give a lot of detail in this brief presentation. So I'm going to take a deep breath. We're going to switch gears. We're going to switch to the uh, award program done virtually it doesn't take too long so don't don't worry we're not going to run over by a whole lot here um i first wanted to again highlight uh something dean page mentioned uh which is yesterday uh the uh medical alumni association association distinguished graduate alumni award was given to junji chen uh, professor and Chair of Experimental Radiation Oncology at the MD uh, Anderson Cancer Center. He received his PhD in 1993 here at UVM, and he gave a, a really very entertaining presentation entitled Random Thoughts uh, Between uh, Experiments. I guess my favorite question from the session was when people say, well, did you ever have a hypothesis that failed or a study that didn't work? And of course, uh, he answered it very well. And of course, if you haven't, you haven't been doing, doing research. Um, so that was yesterday. And then uh, as Dean Page mentioned earlier today, we had last year's research laureate give, give her address on obesity and asthma, how fat affects flow. And it was truly a wonderful presentation. And with all the challenges of doing a virtual presentation from England, and actually went through without a, a single uh, snafu. So again, congratulations to Ann Dixon. So this is our uh, Research Celebration Awards program. Uh, we're gonna start with uh, Graduate Student Showcase and Trainee Awards. I'm gonna turn it over to Chris Berger for that. Then we're gonna do some of the UVM uh, Health Network Medical Group Awards, then our staff and LCOM faculty awards. Since it's virtual, we can't hand them awards. Uh, they will go uh, by inter-office mail. Uh, before I turn it over to Chris, I wanted to just show you uh, the uh, student and trainee awards, our uh, lovely uh, plaques uh, like that. Uh, Later, when we get to the faculty and staff awards, they are lovely plaques like that. It would make a nice cheese board, but it's really too nice to be a, to be a cheese board. So instead, I would put it on the wall. Um, and on that note, I'll turn it over to Chris Berger.
Thank you very much, Dean Jensen. Uh, this is always a highlight of my year to uh, present these awards. And we will start with the Graduate Student Research Showcase Awards that occurred on Monday. And as usual, the student presentations were outstanding um, from top to bottom. And the judges commented, and um, even people stopped by to comment who weren't judges on how difficult this must have been, and it was. And I would like to thank our judges, doctors, Brandon Bensel, uh, Roxana Del Rio Guerra, uh, John Salagianis, and Catherine Shutt for um, helping me with this difficult task. So now on to the awards. In the um, junior division for uh, the Graduate Student Research Showcase, first place went to Bryn Lofness from the McGinnis Lab, uh, representing the Departments of Psychiatry and the Complex Systems Graduate Program. And a close runner up was Allison Morrissey from the Lee Lab in the Department of Microbiology, Molecular Genetics, and the CMB Graduate Program. So congratulations to both of you. And then moving on to the grad, the senior graduate student division. First place went to JJ Bavona, a member of the Pointer Lab in the Department of Medicine and the CMB program. And again, a close runner up was uh, Jeffrey Brabeck from the Mahoney Lab in the Department of Neurological Sciences and NGP. So again, congratulations to all of the participants and our winners and runners up. Now I would like to move on to the Dean's Excellence in Research Awards for publications, starting with graduate students. And the 2021 winner is Leslie Sapaniak in the Stump Lab for um, her paper on micronuclei in KIF-18A mutant mice form stable micronuclear envelopes and do not promote tumor genesis. Congratulations, Leslie. Next, moving on to the um, medical Student Award is Reese Nidecker, uh, mentored by Gregory Holmes in Neurological Sciences, for his paper on the effects of early life seizures on coordination of hippocampal prefrontal ne networks, influence of sex and dynamic brain states. Congratulations, Reese. In the um, postdoctoral division for an outstanding research publication. The winner is Michelle Clock uh, in the Berry Lab for her paper on recurrent febrile seizures after intrahippocampal temporal coordination, but do not cause spatial learning impairments. And then finally, last but not least, our resident outstanding research publication goes to Stephen Ranny, who was actually nominated for not one but two papers but his paper in the Malhorta lab on um, delay in ICU transfer is protecting against ICU readmission in trauma patients. A naturally controlled experiment was selected as the winner. So again, I congratulate all of our trainees on their outstanding work and look forward to your continued accomplishments in the future. And with that, back to you, Dean Jensen. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dean Berger. And again, uh, congratulations uh, to all of our uh, students and trainees. Uh, Going to shift gears to the UVM Health Network uh, Medical Group. And first, the awarded uh, research grants. Uh, the first to Sherry Kadanga and cardiology mentors Michael Toth and Peter Van Buren, looking at neuromuscular electrical electrical stimulation and heart failure patients to improve recovery following hospitalization. Uh, the second uh, to Diego Adrianza and Herrera in Hemonc, mentors uh, Neil Zakai uh, and Andrew Sparks on identifying patient and treatment factors associated with cardiovascular disease and myelodysplastic syndromes. Uh, congratulations to uh, both the PIs and uh, their mentors on your uh, medical group uh, research grants. The next one is the uh, UVM Health Network uh, Medical Group Innovation Grant awarded to Michael uh, Herher uh, in neurology. Uh, mentors Noah Kolb and Bernard uh, Cole. Uh, the study to look at myasthenia gravis remote monitoring system, a pilot feasibility. 
uh, congratulations uh, on uh, receiving this uh, innovation grant to uh, Michael. Next are the uh, UVM had a, a Health Network Medical Group uh, Junior Researcher of the Year Award, uh, which goes to Timothy uh, Plant, Assistant uh, Professor of uh, uh, Medicine. Uh, highlights include his receipt of uh, two grants as PI and several other grants as co-investigator. He's a recipient of the UVM Bloomfield Early Career Professorship in Cardiovascular Science. He's published uh, 29 peer-reviewed research papers over the last uh, five years, has mentored uh, several uh, medical students, and is studying uh, hypertension using electronic health record data and translational approaches. Uh, congratulations to uh, Tim Plant uh, on this uh, significant recognition. Next award is the UVM Health Network Medical Group uh, Faculty Practice Senior Researcher of the Year Award, which goes to Roger Soul, the H. Wallace Professor of Neonatology. Uh, notable highlights include his service as Vice President of the Vermont Oxford Network and Director of Network Clinical Trials. He's a coordinating editor for Cochrane Neonatal an author and co-author of 39 Cochrane reviews, 167 peer-reviewed papers, and 14 book chapters. He is a national and international leader in neonatal clinical trials and health services uh, research. Uh, congratulations to Dr. Saul on this uh, important uh, recognition. So those are the awards from the uh, UVM uh, Health Network. We'll now turn to the uh, Dean's Excellence in Research Awards. Uh, and first we'll do the staff awards. Uh, the recipient of the Research Laboratory Staff Award is Susan uh, Richardson, nominated by Valerie Harder in Pediatrics. Congratulations to uh, Susan uh, Richardson on this recognition. Next are our staff awards for clinical research coordinators. There was a tie uh, for this award among two outstanding uh, recipients shown on this slide. Uh, Alexander Freen was a clinical research coordinator nominated by Melissa Davidson in anesthesiology and Patricia Lutton, a clinical research coordinator nominated by Beth Kirkpatrick and Mary Claire Walsh in microbiology and uh, molecular genetics. Congratulations to, to both uh, recipients. And I just wanna take a moment to recognize that so much of what we do here at L Common Research would not be possible without the supporting research personnel. Thank you so much. Now we move to the uh, Dean's uh, Mentorship Award. Uh, this year, this goes to Jason Bates, nominated by the Medicine Research Committee. He's Professor of Medicine in the Department of Medicine, Division of Pulmonary Disease and Critical Care. Dr. Bates has mentored 36 postdoctoral trainees, 25 graduate students, numerous undergraduate and high school students, and four junior faculty NIH K awardees. In his 22 years at UVM, this corresponded to 17 postdocs, 16 grad students, and four junior faculty. And uh, it should be noted that many of these uh, trainees and mentees have gone on to prominent academic research careers. Dr. Bates was the founder of the bioengineering PhD program at UVM and until recently was a graduate coordinator for that program. And he also was the longstanding co-PI for the T32 training grant in lung biology uh, and uh, disease. So congratulations uh, to Dr. Bates uh, on this uh, mentorship uh, recognition. The Dean's Clinical Trials Award uh, goes to Richard Solomon, uh, again nominated by the Medicine Research Committee. He's a Patrick Professor of Medicine, Department of Medicine, Chief of the Division of Nephrology. His very first prospective randomized clinical trial was a seminal paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine, who examined the role of fluid administration in prevention of contrast-related acute kidney injury. Over 20 years since, he's conducted larger multi-center 
prospective randomized trials that explored the role of different contrast agents, use of sodium bicarbonate, atrial naturetic peptide, and more recently, low-frequency ultrasound to prevent contrast-associated acute kidney injury. He's also designed and managed many of the national multicenter trials looking to prevent acute kidney injury, as well as being a site PI for trials to slow progression of chronic kidney disease using angiotensin receptor blockers and mineralocorticoid receptor blockers. Congratulations to Dr. Solomon on this clinical trials research recognition. Next is the Dean's Rising Star New Investigator Award, which is an assistant professor level award. This goes to Michael Previs, who was nominated by David Warshaw. Michael is an assistant professor, Department of Molecular Physiology and Biophysics. He applies state-of-the-art uh, proteomic and biophysical techniques to investigate the molecular basis of, of cardiac and skeletal muscle contractile function in human health and disease. He has 33 peer-reviewed uh, papers, some in high-impact journals like Journal of Molecular and Cellular Cardiology, Journal of General Physiology, and PNAS. And he has contributed to our mechanistic understanding of how a can cardiac contractile protein regulator operates at the molecular level. His findings provide clues as to why genetic mutations in this protein are the leading cause of cardiac hypertrophy and offer a molecular mechanistic target for therapeutic intervention. Congratulations go to Michael Previs. The Dean's mid-career Investigator Award, which is an associate professor level award, goes to Jason Stumpf, again nominated by David Warshaw. Uh, Jason's associate professor in molecular physiology and biophysics. His research program is focused on understanding how chromosomes are moved and organized during cell division from the single molecule to the whole organism level. Uh, he's providing better understanding of mechanisms that preserve uh, genomic integrity and also identifying new molecular targets for cancer therapy. He's received a number of competitive research awards and he is currently the PI on two active NIH R01s and has published 41 peer review papers. Uh, congratulations go to Dr. Stump on this mid career investigator recognition. And last, the uh, very prestigious Dean's Research Laureate Award, which is a full professor award, goes to Yvonne Jansen Heinegger, nominated by Mark Fung. Dr. Jansen Heinegger is professor of pathology and laboratory medicine. She is the recipient of a prestigious R35 Outstanding Investigator Award from NIH. She has been awarded an incredible 16 R01 grants. She was named a university scholar at UVM in 2018. She's been issued five US patents and two international patents. She's published 217 papers, 15 book chapters, has been cited more than 6,000 times. She was recipient of the Elcom Dean's Research Mentor Award in 2017 and has supervised the research of 29 grad students, 11 postdoctoral fellows, and nine undergraduate students. Congratulations to Dr. Jensen Heinegger on this very exciting award, and we'll look forward to your uh, laureate lecture next year. Now it is precisely five o'clock, uh, as promised. I want to thank all everyone who participated in this uh, series of events. In particular, I'd like to acknowledge Chris uh, Berger, Elizabeth Dorman, Aaron Montgomery, Joanne McVeigh, Vicki Gilway and Bruce Kimball, and all of our award nomination reviewers and judges. And to uh, finalize, to all of our research faculty, staff, and trainees, thank you for your many contributions to our research mission. Hope you all have a good evening, and please reach out to me if you have any questions or concerns that you'd like to share. Congratulations to all of our award recipients. It uh, truly has been a fun afternoon. Good night.